I'm back, new video. Big announcement today, Johnson & Johnson's back, and they're eager to keep their market share. They've got the second dose results back. So basically, Johnson & Johnson, they did a real-world study. They find that vaccine efficacy against hospitalization from the one-dose J&J shot is something in the high 70s, low 80s ballpark. They also have an ongoing study that has read out some results. It looks like with a booster dose or second dose of the J&J shot, they enjoy near-perfect efficacy against hospitalization from SARS-CoV-2. So those are good news for J&J. But it makes me wonder about this J&J &J vaccine saga, and it makes me wonder what drug regulators are going to do, vaccine regulators and vaccine advisory committees. Here's why. About a month ago, at late August. We had Paul Sachs and colleague write an op-ed in the New York Times where they made the persuasive case, I felt, that had you received a J&J &J vaccine, you ought to get a booster. And they actually made the argument that the booster you could think about getting is an mRNA booster. At that point, Pfizer had a full FDA approval and it could be used for this purpose. And I would advise you to go read their op-ed to see their case. And over the last few months, we've seen over and over the government advisors, Francis Collins, a Surgeon General, they had said, hang tight for those people who got one dose of J&J. &J. We're going to get some information to you. We're going to give you a path to booster. And at last, we see now that J&J &J has their press release results, and there is some pathway, I think, coming forward that that might lead to a booster. But here's my question. Why are we so wedded to a J&J &J booster in people who got the first J&J? &J? Why aren't we thinking more like Paul Sachs? And my concern, of course, is that... This company is trying to preserve their market share, which is roughly about 15 million Americans, and continue the J&J &J line in those people. But I think it is an open question as to which of these vaccines, the mRNA technology or the adenoviral vector technology, would be best suited for someone who got a J&J &J shot. Now, the thing that I want to know more than anything, more than the efficacy of the J&J &J shot number two, is the rate of... You guessed it, VIT, vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia and thrombosis. This is the known and fearsome complication of the adenoviral vector vaccines seen with AstraZeneca, seen with Johnson & Johnson, and I want to know how high that VIT goes after dose two. That's, in fact, the only question on my mind, the rate of VIT after dose two. And so I'm really going to want to see in the weeks to come, somebody convince me that for a woman younger than the age of 50 or 55 or even 60, that it is in their best interest to get a second J&J &J slug, knowing that there might be some rate of VIT. And that rate might be higher than what we saw with dose one. And at some age, younger than 30, younger than 25, I think I'm really going to want to see very clear and convincing data that the benefits outweigh the harms.